people. I think a lot of times we lose our composure. We lose our composure as competitors. We lose it as parents. And I think that we have to count to 10, as, as they say, and just say, hey, this happens. This is what makes you who you are. There's nobody in life, nobody, that doesn't fail or lose at some point. It's how you respond to that that really um, separates you from being a, a, a true champion. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode here on You Think, presented by Audiorama, and as always, our friends at Invisalign. Um, well, as you can tell, I'm not in my normal studio. I am actually in a hotel room in the outskirts of Atlanta. I've been here now for four days. Tomorrow will be day five of one of those crazy baseball tournaments that we talk about a lot here on You Think. Um, We have come down to Atlanta for the big Perfect Game World Series. There is 66 teams from all over the country, and we played two games on Friday, two games on Saturday, a game on Sunday, and that was just pool play. This morning, we advanced on to the championship bracket, and we played an eight inning. So we only played six, so two extra innings. It was a wild finish. Uh, The kids fought back, and we ended up pulling it out. So that's why I am coming to you from Atlanta, as opposed to my studio in Charlotte. And uh, so we are tired. We have played our sixth baseball game, and tomorrow we could potentially play three more. So pray for all of us. It has been a long weekend of youth sports, but that's what we do here on You Think. And uh, I think today's episode is going to be an absolute blast. We have Kim Mulkey. Um, She is, I'll tell you, I was blown away with our conversation. She was funny. She's smart. She's tough. Um, Just her her mantra and her philosophies of coaching and parenting. You know, she's one of the most accomplished basketball coaches, male or female, in the history of of college basketball. And for her to come on and share her experiences, her upbringing um, as an athlete, but then obviously her transition into a historic coaching career was just an absolute... uh, pleasure to to speak with coach. So a lot going on here at you think as always. Uh, thank you guys always for following along. I think you guys are going to love this episode with uh, with coach Mulkey. Thanks as always to our presenting sponsor Invisalign. Invisalign is the number one doctor trusted brand having transformed 12 million smiles over the last 25 years. Invisalign gives you the opportunity to continue to make trusted decisions that can help you continue to build confidence for your child. So find your trusted provider at Invisalign.com or talk to your doctor. So now please enjoy this conversation with Hall of Fame basketball coach and head women's basketball coach at LSU, Kim Mulkey. Coach Mulkey, thank you so much for joining us today here on You Think. Well, thank you for having me. It's an honor and uh, I'm just grateful that uh, we can do this. As, as am I and, and our listeners and viewers, they're going to be in for a treat because I think everyone who follows college athletics is familiar with your resume, your accomplishments, and uh, we're going to start from the beginning. You know, a big, a big thing here on You Think is we're kind of covering the journey and the story of what does, you know, today's youth sports experience look like and maybe compared to the youth sports experience, you know, some of us had years back. So I, I want to take you back to growing up in Louisiana. Um, you know, it's well chronicled. You were one of the first females to to play organized sports here with men, with boys growing up and, and just where you built your, you know, your career as a player, just take us back to your experiences early on. You know, what was it about basketball? Was it the opportunity? Was it just exposure? Like what was it that gravitated you towards basketball and, and what went into an amazing career now as a coach in those early days? Growing up uh, during the time that I was, you know, 10, 11, and 12, you didn't have bitty basketball for girls or a basketball league for girls. What you had back then was like Dixie Youth Baseball and Pony League Baseball, and you had some softball, but not a lot of softball under the high school age. And so my first taste of organized sports was Dixie Youth Baseball with the guys at 12 years old. And I tried out, and I was the only girl, first girl to ever uh, try out and and play in the uh, Hammond area and um, loved it. And I knew I could play with them because they were picking me every day at recess to be on their team. And 
I had nothing else to do in the summer, so I uh, tried out and played shortstop, pitcher, and catcher. I was the first one selected in the draft, and of course, Greg, you know what that meant. You're going to the worst team. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and so uh, made the all-star team and uh, didn't have a real good experience in the all-stars. I didn't get uh, to play in the all-star game because I was a girl. Uh, to shorten the explanation to all that, I had to stand outside the dugout, watch my team play. And, of course, now we know uh, girls can play. Uh, I did it because I knew, one, that I was good enough and uh did it for all the right reasons, just needed to compete, needed something to do in the summer. So the next two years I played Pony League and made the all-star team as a second baseman there. And then about that time, I'm starting high school. So once I got to high school, they had more organized sports in the summer for girls. I then started playing uh, basketball, AAU basketball in the summer, at the same time playing softball in the summer, and then, of course, playing for my high school teams. Uh, the greatest uh, years of your life are college. I firmly believe that. And the second greatest years of your life are when you're involved in youth sports and organized sports and what fond memories I have. Uh, it, it's so true. that The youth sports experience is there's nothing like it. And I'm going through it now as a, as a parent, but when, when you're 12 years old and you're standing outside the dugout and, 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 you know, you are you mature enough? Are you aware enough? Now, I, I know you are looking back to understand the significance of what it meant for you to kind of pioneer that path and, and kind of break through as a, as a, as a woman playing with boys, but like, did you understand at 12 years old, just what the challenges that you were facing growing up as a woman with, you know, before title nine, before equal rights for men's and women's sports and equal opportunities. Like, did you understand it at the time, just how significant it was, what you were doing? Not at all. You're living in the moment. Your mind is a 12 year old. And I was very mature uh, at that age in that I probably uh, could think deeper than most 12 year olds that just live in the moment. But I was living in the moment. I was in shock and didn't understand why I couldn't play. We were doing in and out, you know, we were, we were warming up and yeah. uh, they asked me to come off the field and, and one group is explaining they're not letting me play because there was a technicality on the roster. And, and the other group has said, you know exactly why you're not letting her play. And it was because she's a girl. Uh, one group is saying, you're going to have to forfeit the game. If she doesn't get out of the dugout, the other group saying, stay in the dugout. And these are grown ups. These are your role models. And I just looked at my father and I said, I'm not going to allow the game to be forfeited by my teammates. It's not fair to them. And so I said, I will stand outside of the dugout. I will watch the game. And that's what I did. And uh, not in that moment thinking that this will be fought later in the courts and it'll all work itself out. All I wanted to do was play and be a part of it. Of course. And, and, and of course, I mean, when you're 12 and you can't really understand the, the levels and the significance of, you know, what would transpire moving forward through, you know, through title nine to, to where the moment in time we are today with women's sports in general across the country. But what were, you mentioned the adults and, and we have a thing here where it's, it, we're typically the youth sports experience. And I would even probably argue to some case, even at the level uh, at the collegiate level and whatnot, sometimes the, it's most of the time, the adults, either the parents or the coaches of the youth sports who kind of ruined the experience. So you mentioned the adults, what were the conversations with, you mentioned your dad is standing right there. Like as a father, what, when he sees his little girl being kind of pulled and, and used as kind of a prop in this internal battle within this little league of should a girl play with the boys or not? Like what were the conversations you would have with him? Not only in that moment in real time, but as you continued to get ready for high school and continued to play, like what were those conversations? How did they try to educate you on the world that you were kind of very on the forefront and kind of the tip of that spear? Ironically, my dad had gotten wind earlier in the day that this could potentially happen, and he never shared that with me. So he had done some research and had, um, <clears throat> I don't know exactly who all the people were there at the game to witness it, um, but he didn't know how I would react. And I'm so appreciative that I did not know anything going into that game because I would have been just so devastated, but I had to be 
who I was in that moment. And my dad supported my decision. And that was, that was so big for me because a lot of adults don't listen to their children at 12 years old because they think, and they are more knowledgeable and they understand things a little better, but he could see the hurt in me, but he also respected that I just didn't want to hurt my team. I did not want me being a girl to be bigger than them winning a, a baseball game and having a chance to continue on. And so after the game is when he shared with me um, how he found out about it and all the, the TV cameras and the people that were there at the game got involved. And I just asked him, do not um, allow anyone to disrupt what my team is trying to do. And dad, you can later fight this in the courts or take it wherever it needs to be taken. But I respect him so much for listening to me and understanding that my team and, and those guys in that dugout were far more important than me playing. It's just such a, it's just so incredible to hear at 12 years old, that maturity, I, I think to the, to the teams that we coach and I, and I'm trying to think to myself, like how would I have handled it today, let alone as a 12 year old, you know, if I, if that was my child, my son or daughter, and they were being used as a kind of a prop to kind of make a point or a political statement or, you know, societal, whatever you want to call it, how would I have handled it? And to hear you at 12 and then your father kind of handle it in such a mature way. How, how much would you say that moment, right? It was the first story that you brought up. It's the first thing we've talked about. So it's obviously, you know, very close to your heart, very close to your mind. Would you say that you've carried that experience? Has that fueled you? Have you carried that passion and that commitment to team and sacrifice and the ups and downs and the struggles you've been through dealing with the adversity you have? Like, has that been something you've carried forward? Has that been a big factor into why you've been so successful? Greg, I think every experience we have yeah. as people, uh, as athletes, it fuels you and it makes you who you are. Life's experiences make us who we are. It develops us, not necessarily our personalities. I think your personalities may be somewhat how you're raised and, and maybe you're even born with a certain personality. But I think that some people would have taken that and just, um, you know, lost their composure. Emotions would have been involved and it would have been just really ugly. And I just didn't want that. And I think that's just one example of so many things that happened in my life that, you know, I wrote about it in my book that I just mm -hmm. don't talk much about, but people need to understand we're all in some ways discriminated against either by the color of our skin, by our gender, by our, uh, you know, being rich, being poor. It, it, there's so many ways to be discriminated against. And we all probably have these stories that motivated us, that made us who we are, uh, good or bad, and how we react to it is who we are. And uh, I, I definitely think that that was impactful. And, and as I told you, I, I'll never forget it. But I also don't walk around with a chip on my shoulder. Uh, I don't let it define me. I don't let it make me a bitter person. Uh, you learn from it. And you learn so much about life through athletics. I tell people all the time, I don't care if you're the superstar, you're the starter, you're the bench player, you're the water boy. I don't care. Athletics prepares you for the real world. And I believe that it, it's so true. And, and that's something that we, we talk about a lot on here. You know, that's, that's a big part of the conversations we've had with a lot of our guests and just a big part of our philosophy here. You know, one of our key tenants is sports is so much more than the sport, right? And yes, you're, you're going to show up to a practice and you're going to learn how to make a jump shot and you're going to learn how to, you know, dribble and you're going to field a ground ball or, you know, whatever the sport is. But can you, as a coach, can you, as a parent, as the adult, can you find all the other attributes that sports provide resilience, toughness, adversity, teamwork, you know, dealing, you know, maybe having, you know, different people with different goals individually, but coming together for one common goal, just all these lessons that we can teach these kids. And that's something with a lot of the youth teams that we spend a lot of time in, you know, yes, we're here to learn ground balls. Yes. We're here to learn motion offense, but we're here to grow up as adults boys. I have a daughter also. She plays soccer. So boys, girls, all the same, like how can we learn these lessons at a young age through sports? And that's a big, so to hear you kind of echo that is, is very, very 
in line with how we operate here. Something else before we get into your obviously Hall of Fame legendary coaching career. One other thing, I'm always curious where people's passions come from. Like what you mentioned it, are you born with it? Is it something you develop? I believe every person has an innate kind of energy and innate, you know, attitude, a, a kind of a competitive fire. And we've all seen you coach your your career, your resume speaks for itself. You talk about when you're 12 years old competing with the boys. Like, can you put your finger on where it all started? Like, what made you the competitor and and the person that you are? Is there one moment? Is it just the way you were brought up? Was it your family? What what would you say if you had to put your finger on it? I don't know that I could pick just one moment. I, I think back in my life and I think, you know, what is it that made me um, so competitive? What is it that made me... Um, want to excel on the court, uh, on the field, in the classroom. Um, I don't know that there's one um, one thing. I, I think it was just internal that I just wanted to sit and, and compete with the smartest kids in class. Even though I knew they were smarter than me, I didn't want them to think I wasn't as smart as they were. So I would stay up the wee hours of the morning studying. Um, I wanted to graduate valedictorian in my class, and there was no way I was the smartest kid in the class, but I outworked them. I studied harder. Um, it just is a drive that you have, and then sports was something that made me feel good. I remember the first trophy I ever won was a skating marathon, roller skating. I was 12 years old, and you um, skated, and you got a 10-minute break every 24 or every, I don't know, hour or what it was. Anyway, I came in fourth place, and the three that beat me were adults. And I just thought that was so cool that I was the young 12-year-old that could hang in there and and just do something competitively. And um, I remember watching Nadia Comaneci on television when she was the gymnast for Romania. Yep. And I just thought, how does she do that? And just, I don't know, it made me feel good. Sports made me feel good. Now, that doesn't mean every moment was was fun, but it just, it, it brought me a sense of worth. Um, it just was, I don't know, it's just something I love. And and to this day, I still love it. I, I mean, I, I was pumped last night watching the Celtics and the, the Warriors, and I was like, that is the way the game is supposed to be played every time you step on the floor. It's so true. That was, that was a remarkable game. Can you, in, in your experience, I mean, your experience as a player and as a coach is unmatched, can you coach competitive spirit? I think that competitive and passion and those deep feelings are who you are. And I don't ever want anybody to apologize for that. But don't let it consume you. You're going to lose in life. And you don't have to like losing. But you have to control your emotions enough to be respectful of the opponent that just beat you. And yet at the same time, let that drive you. I think a lot of times... We lose our composure. We lose our composure as competitors. We lose it as parents. And I think that we have to count to 10, as as they say, and just say, hey, this happens. This is what makes you who you are. There's nobody in life, nobody, that doesn't fail or lose at some point. It's how you respond to that that really um, separates you from being a, a, a true champion. Well, I, I think those are those are incredible words that I, I hope all of our vi- our listeners and and viewers and parents and coaches and everybody who listens to our pod here on you think I hope they take all that to heart. I know I'm probably at the top of that list who could sometimes count to ten and <laughs> regroup while I'm coaching some of the kids stuff. Um, you know, you go on to play and have an incredible career at Louisiana Tech um, as a player. Um, you played for the U.S. national team, multiple Olympics. You know, accomplished career as a player. I want to transition a little bit though into the impact that you've made as a coach. You got into assistant coaching. You were the first uh, person in women's NCAA history to win a national championship as a player, as an assistant coach, and of course, as a head coach. So I want to I want to talk a little bit about just your principles of coaching. A lot of our listeners and viewers here are coaching at the youth level, the high school level, whether they're parents or whether they're volunteers or whatnot. I just want to get into a little bit of your philosophy as a coach. You know, what are the core principles? If I sent my daughter to play basketball for coach... What what would you what what are the key tenants that are that are must haves in a program that you're running? 
Well, I could name a lot, but I'm going to try to just kind of describe what, who I am. I'm yep. real. I'm honest. I'm passionate. And I'm going to give you everything I have on that sideline every day. And that's all I ever wanted from a coach. Teach me the game. Be honest with me. Make me better and make me a better person. And those are the things that I just try to, to I don't want to say make a player see in me. Be who you are. Players aren't going to be hoodwinked. You cannot hoodwink players. When you walk in that locker room, you better know what you're telling them. You better believe in what you're telling them. And you better be able to have them run through a wall for you. Some of the best coaches I ever played for were terrible motivators. They would give you all this great knowledge. And I thought, well, no, okay, we know all that. But, you know, motivate me a little bit. I'm not good at being passive. Um, passive coaches do not motivate me. I always wanted to play for those coaches that pumped their fist and, and got excited and challenged me as a player. And, you know, the sideline, when, when I'm into it, I don't remember, Greg, half the stuff I do because I'm in the moment with those players. I'm feeling it with them. And that's the way I played the game. Um, and it doesn't mean that every player has to be that way, but I do believe this, nothing in life, nothing great is ever achieved without enthusiasm. If you don't have enthusiasm for, for going to work every day and do what you do, then quit doing it. But that doesn't mean every day is going to be great. That doesn't mean some days you're not going to be worn out. That doesn't mean some days you're going to wake up, man, I'm just tired. That's normal. But if you don't have enthusiasm, um, you know, why do you do what you do? I, I, I feel like you and I are like, spirit animals. I feel like I, I listening to you talk is literally, it's like I could be sitting here saying it. And, and sometimes it doesn't always translate. Not every family, not every player, especially at the, at the younger age where I'm kind of spending more of my time with my kids. Not everyone likes that, right? Not everyone likes that intensity. Not everyone likes that fire. Not everyone likes their kid being challenged. And, and, to, and I, and I feel like it is a little bit different. I try never to be that guy and say, well, back when I grew up, it but it is a little bit different. Do you even see it? I mean, you're playing at the highest of levels and, and obviously your athletes are a little bit older. Do you see in, in your career, do you see a change in how kids are willing to be coached, how parents are willing to have their, their children coached? Like, do, do you see a change or do you feel like a lot of that is just made up? I think you there with anything in life, change is inevitable. And we can embrace certain changes or we can deny those changes. I firmly believe this. Young people want to have somebody that believes in them and pushes them to become something that they're capable of becoming. What gets in the way are parents who believe a, they know more than a coach or that that's just not the way to reach my kid um, okay, you do know your child better than a coach, but at the moment, step aside and go, that is that coach's profession. And my child may or may not be motivated by that, but let's see. Let's give that child and that coach the opportunity to see if they mesh and if they can get the best out of them. Because really a great coach is going to figure out what motivates every player. Now, you played football. That's a bigger number than I have to deal with in a locker room. But it takes time to see, is that child motivated by a wink? Is that child motivated by a quick kick in the rear? Is that child, you know, but you don't change how you approach the entire team in the game. Um, I just really believe that... Um, Young people, I, I will never change my mind about this. I do believe that they just want somebody to believe in them and help them become what they're capable of becoming. And it's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be a pat on the back. But, you know, society has changed. I know that I look back a lot of times, and I know you do too, at the way we were coached by our coaches. Well, those guys couldn't do today what they could do to us back then. No doubt. 
And yet, Greg, it made us who we are. We're no not, doubt. we're not, you know, we didn't crumble. We're not, uh, we're not just uh, scarred for life. It's memories that we have, good or bad. We may agreed with them or not agreed with them, but that's life. And I just think sometimes we get caught up into everything needs to be sweet and nice and let's give a participation trophy. What are we teaching young people if we don't teach them how to handle different types of personalities, different types of cultures in that locker room, different types of failure? It's life. Life is not easy. And that's where athletics just gives you this free book. You don't even have to pay for it. All you have to do is sign up to be on a team and you learn this for free. And it's not going to always be the way you want it to be. It's supposed to be hard. Sure. That's, that's what I try to tell my kids all the time. Like I can, my kids are listening to this podcast the minute it comes out because I need them to hear it from you because they're tired of hearing it from me. It's supposed to be hard. If it was easy, it wouldn't be fun. There'd be nothing to achieve. It's supposed to be a grind. You're supposed to be able, it's supposed to be hard. You're supposed to be disappointed. You're supposed to push through it. That's the journey, right? That's the joy of what makes all this so special. And I completely agree. I believe with all my heart, the people who limit kids the most are the adults. Yes, yes. If the adults would stop saying that's too much, that's too hard, oh no, that's too long, that if they just shut up and got out of the way and these kids want to do it, they want to be pushed to do it. And all of a sudden they look back and they go, oh my God, I could do it. It's, um, you know, what we're parents and we, we talked before your show about we want to protect our kids without question. That is what we do. But protecting your kids from harm, you know, uh, is different than protecting them from learning how to deal with tough situations. I'll give this example. My son gets moved up a couple, two or three weeks ago to the Cardinals. Yep. OK, well, he's on the 40 man. There's going to come a day. It may be today that he gets called DFA. That's not a bad thing. People think, oh, if you get DFA, you're taking off the 40 man. No, that means you have an opportunity to go to another team that needs you or wants you. It's it's life. And and I just deal in the realistic um, world where. I, I, I don't want my children to hurt. You don't want your children to hurt. But guess what? That's what makes us who we are. That becomes our character, our destiny. Um, nothing in life is fair. Nothing in life is easy. Um, but it, I think we get it all screwed up sometimes that, that wanting things uh, in protection of our kids is a little bit different than spoiling them, is a little bit different than, than having them live in an, uh, an unrealistic world. I want them to live in a real world. I want to prepare them. It's my job to teach them out there what it's like uh, to see people drunk at 18 years old, what it's like to, to... I want to be the one to tell them all those things. I don't want somebody else telling them how it should be. I want to be real with them. Don't want to be their best friend. You can't be a child's best friend, but you can be their role model. You can be their mentor. You can be their disciplinary. Um, it's just parenting is not easy, but really I think sometimes we overparent. I learned this term many years ago. You know, we always said, oh, they're an overprotective parent. Greg, they're helicopter parents now. Yep. And I had yep. to study helicopter parents. And then when I've studied it, I was like, yes, that's what we have become, helicopter parents. Uh, I, I just, I don't know. I could write a book on parenting because I've seen it with my own parents. I've seen it, you know, coaching. I've seen it. Um, you want parents involved. Don't get me wrong. You want them involved. But guess what? Uh, step aside. I, you and I wouldn't go in there and tell TJ surgeon how to put that heart in his yeah. chest, would we? No way. Boy, we want the best surgeon, don't we? Absolutely. We got to trust that surgeon. And that's the same way it is in coaching. Find the best coach and look at a resume and say, how can that coach do that with that many different personalities? So all that person, those personalities must be buying into 
what a Kim Mulkey does, what a Gino Ariema does, what those coaches that have success do. And uh, get out of the way and let us coach. I mean, uh, I don't, I'm not even going to follow up with that because that is absolutely spot on and, and can't, couldn't be said any better. You, you mentioned parents and, 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 you know, an, an interesting way I had somebody explain to me, one of our early guests, um, was a psychologist, Dr. Michael Gervais. He said, what we have now is we have helicopter parents and we have Zamboni parents where they got to smooth all the ice out in front of their child. They got to pick which team he's on so they can guarantee a spot in the lineup. They got to pick which school and what teacher he gets so they can make sure it's a teacher that commu- you know, that communicates the way he does. And they just smooth everything. And, and I always say, and I've said this a lot on this show, I, again, my kids are nine and 10. I want my kids to be in the most competitive environment they're capable of handling. I want my kid to stand on the mound at 10 years old and have chaos go on around him and give up a home run, maybe give up the game. I mean, I don't want to see my kid struggle. It rips my guts out, but I'd rather him do it at 10 than all of a sudden control every scenario, smooth that path. And all of a sudden he's a 17 year old senior in high school and in the state championship, he gets walk off home run and he doesn't know how to respond. And I think that's what's happening is failure is inevitable. All we're doing is we're just pushing off the fail, the failure ex- experience for some of these kids thinking we're helping them. But all we're doing is when that failure does come and it's going to come, how do they respond? Well, they haven't ever responded to it their whole lives because we don't ever let them. So I think to hear you give that perspective, my, my question is, how do you deal with the parents at your level? I, I know at the youth level, the parents are very involved or at every practice they're driving the kids to and from. At your level, of course, these kids are off in college and whatnot, but the parent is still part of the equation. I know it's an issue that, you know, parents are a big part of the recruiting process. And then all of a sudden they send their son and daughter to play for you. And what is that experience like? So how do you handle the respect of the parents that they are involved in their child's life and career and experience, but then also drawing that line that they are not overwhelming the program? Well, you start in the recruiting process and you make sure this is the way I approach it. When you sit in that home with that young lady that you're recruiting, you make sure that everyone that's involved in her life, if it's a grandparent that's raising her, if it's parents, have them there. And you tell them now is the time to get to know me. Ask me any question you want. It can be basketball related. It can be academic related. Now is your shot. Because when and if I get that child in my program, we don't ever talk about X's and O's because there's nothing I can tell you that will satisfy you at that moment. But always have lines of communication open with parents on their academics, on their um, welfare, their safety. You make sure that they have free reins to call and talk about anything academically, anything when it comes to their health and safety. You cannot allow it to become a conversation once they get to your program because half of them are mad at you when they leave a game anyway because you didn't get to play them (laughs) enough. You subbed them at the wrong time. You know, they get lost in the X's and O's moment versus how is my kid being treated? Is she on schedule to graduate? Is she healthy? I get it. They only come to games And the majority of them only see their child. That's human nature. But I give them that opportunity in recruiting to to get to know me, to ask me anything. Where where you see my child playing? How much do you see her playing? Who are you recruiting before and after? All those questions I'm open to. But once she makes her decision and she's in the program, it's just difficult to have any more Um, X's and O's conversation because they're not at practice every day. They don't know what's going through your mind as a coach when you sub. They don't see anything but their child. It's that's so well put. I I know a lot of people at the youth level struggle with that, right? There's a lot of in, you know, internalized, I don't want to call it guilt, but there's a lot of internalized pressure that coaches feel because they know a certain family is upset or they know a certain kid didn't play as much. And they, and they're almost, they, they know what's going through those other families. Some coaches don't care. It's water off a duck's back. They don't spend one minute. Other coaches are a little more sensitive to it. They, they internalize it. They understand it. Where are you on that spectrum? Like, how do you find that balance between, yeah, I, I understand where that family's coming from or this athlete's coming from, 
But at the same time, I can't spend too much energy trying to make every family happy. I got a program that I got to run and I got to run it the way I've shown I'm capable of running it. How, how do you handle that? I think you, you're you onto something that is really a touchy situation because when we say youth, we're thinking, you know, five, six, seven, you know, eight years old. It is not the livelihood of that coach to win games. However, you just, it's, we're competitive. Most athletes, former athletes, those that are coaching their own kids, you're competitive just internally. So as a parent, sometimes parents don't live in the real world and they think their child um, needs to maybe be on that really, really good team. And maybe your child needs to be on the lesser team to fulfill what you want you know, them to do. And I yep. think it's hard because some people have the philosophy, Greg, that I'm paying the same amount of money that is, where at the same amount of practices, they should get the same amount of playing time. I see that on paper exactly what you're talking about. But in the course of a game, I think rules have kind of helped coaches knowing they got to play this many innings or, you know, this much playing time. And it kind of, you know, helps the coach. But as they get older, parents need to evaluate their own kids' talents and say, okay, if I want my child on that great team, I might have to understand they may not get that much playing time, but I could take them over here to this team and they could be the superstar on this team. So whatever it is, be fair to your child. Don't cause a scene. Understand and say all these are teaching life's lessons and it's not uh, a bad thing. Then as they get older, you change your philosophy a little bit in that, you know, your kid may get cut. This is the livelihood of that coach to pick the best players. And so then that's another whole emotion that you have to deal with as a parent. But it's all good in the long run. This is all good. And you just can't allow it to overwhelm um, you on, you know, life's lessons that they're learning. And I think what happens, it goes back to we want everything to be perfect and easy for our children. And it's never going to be that way. God, it's so it's you're it, we see what you just said. We see live out with our kids teams and sports that we coach on a daily basis. And and I couldn't agree more. Sometimes on certain teams, if the expectations are clear about what the team's goals are and what, how the team's going to be run and the coach communicates that to the parents, that's all you ask as a parent. If it's a fit, if it's a fit for your kid's right. skill level, his commitment level, great. Then you stick to it. If it's not a fit, I don't believe the team's responsibility is to morph themselves to the needs of the families. I believe it's the family's responsibility to find a team that is compatible with their own belief system, their own competitive system, their own abilities. I, I so I, everything you just said there, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think it ne leads to a really important next question, which is uh, what do you see as the balance between development and winning? And, and I know you're in a winning world, or right? again, you're, you're, you're at a high, a very high level of, of athletics, but in its core, you do in your heart, I'm, again, not to speak for you, you in your heart recruited every one of these girls to your school. You want to see them develop and grow into great people and, of course, great basketball players. But then there's also the component where you're expected to win. LSU didn't pay you and bring you down there to not win. They brought you there for a reason. What is that in your mind? How do you find that balance between developing every kid on your roster but also saying, hey, at the end of the day, though, when games start, I'm going to play the girls who give us the best chance of winning. And that's the way it goes. Well, you said a mouthful. At the end of the day, whether it's pro sports, whether it's college, we have to win. That's what usually, unless you get in trouble outside of your profession, winning is what, how we keep a job. But you have to make sure you're developing them every day in practice. You have to put them in situations every day in practice so that when the games come, you want the games to be easier than they are in practice. Sometimes that's not, you know, that's not available because, like, you don't have the talent, yet you're recruiting the talent. So 
in the perfect scenario, I am evaluating and practicing uh, every day harder than I do in the games. And then when you get in the games, the thing that's different is the lights are on, experience. And so believe it or not, I can practice, practice, practice hard every day. And that's where you get your playing time. But there are those, and you know this to be true, that when the lights come on, you see a different player. Sometimes you see a player that's like, wow, where has that been? And then sometimes you see the player that's been great in practice. And boy, as they say in the locker room, they nut up in a game, right? Yep. yep. And so it's, it's, it's a, you got to really, really do a good job of evaluating. And so um, I never compromise winning at the expense of pacifying any kid whose feelings are hurt or, you know, who might need to get a few minutes in and all that. It's my job to make them better. Here's where at our level, the only issue, um, and it's not an issue, but people want to see their kids play right out of the gate as freshmen. I can think in 38 years of my coaching, 21 at Baylor, my first year at LSU, I can think of two freshmen that came in game ready for college at the elite level. And and that's a lot of All-Americans that I coach. That's a lot of great ones that I've coached, but it's more physical. It's uh, faster, it's stronger. And it hits them, bam, the minute they get on campus as a freshman that I'm more talented than that kid that's a junior and senior at my position. But, boy, she sure is knocking me all over the floor. That's where you can't rush time. You can't rush it. You have to let it evolve. Some pick it up sooner than others. And it's just a flow. And that's the way it is. Probably at the pro level, you know, you can answer that better than I can. But... Um, It's just a, I hate the word process. I hate to hear coaches say, trust the process, because a lot of people don't know what that means. We know what it means. So when I say that, I just explain to them, this is the maturity of the elite athlete. Yes, there are some that never have to come in as freshmen or first year players and, and sit more than they like. That's, that's God given, you know, above level talent that others don't have, but it just, it's, it's an evolution and it happens. And the great ones uh, just keep climbing that ladder. Yeah. It's so well said. And, 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 and any level you go up, whether it's from, you know, I remember my first day as a ninth grader in high school, Oh my God, eighth grade, you are the man. And all of a sudden now you look down the, you look down the lockers and it's the seniors and you're like, I'll never play there. And then it's the same thing when I got to Miami as a freshman and, and so on down the road. It, it, there is an evolution to the entire thing. So I think that's really important. The, the last segment uh, before we let you go, and we've talked a lot about obviously your coaching philosophies and your career. I want to just talk a little bit about being a parent and being a mother and your approach. Um, you have one son who you mentioned um, is in the St. Louis Cardinals um, major league, you know, just made the, the major league team has been in their system for a while. Um, your daughter, Mackenzie, who then coached with you, but before that she played for you, um, your national championship team, um, of course in Baylor, I just want to talk about your philosophies. Now spin your cap around how you approached raising your children as competitive athletes. They both reached the highest of levels. You know, what was your approach as a mom? You know, speak to the moms out there, the dads out there, you know, how did you raise two highly competitive athletes from an early age? Well, I think back, I was never going to be, uh, you know, this, this mother, oh, I want to have all these kids. You know, I never babysat growing up. I was always just playing sports. But I will tell you, the birth of my two children, and I know you know this as well, it's the greatest thing ever. Uh, it's, it's just, it, it, it's awesome. And they grew up in a house, um, and all they ever saw was ball games. And so, um, but yet they were both, they both understood that if you never want to play sports, tell me what it is you want to do and let's get involved in something. Find your niche. That's all I ever told them. Find your niche and mom will be there. Then when I went through my divorce, it was basically me and the kids, and I have a very simple philosophy. I told them, I will be at all of your ball games, 
unless, you know, I'm in the hospital. I will work my schedules around your ball games because, Greg, I never wanted, and I, this sounds a little bit gory, I guess, but I said I never want them to look at me in a casket and say my mom's career was more important to her than us. I so, have that's so powerful practices to go to their games. I played McKenzie played for the state championship in high school. I had to get somewhere in an hour and a half. We were getting ready to play. It's work and you have to have help. Uh, but I, I just, I didn't want to miss anything they did. I would go and you can appreciate this. I would go after my practices and sit in my car and I would eat a little snack and I would watch Kramer in his eighth grade football practices because I loved it. I loved it. I, I, the coach in me, the mother in me, I, and they never knew I was sitting in those cars, not to evaluate a coach. It was just, I love sports. And um, I had McKenzie's coach tell me one time, she said, Kim, everybody asked me, how difficult is it to coach Kim Mulkey's daughter? And she said, that's ridiculous. See, people get these preconceived uh, uh, opinions that, God, that would be intimidating. Man, she's looking over your shoulder, everything you do. And she just laughs about it. And she says, maybe the greatest parent I've ever had in a program. She stays away. Call her if you need her. But, yes, yeah, she's sitting up in the stands and she's watching. Well, so what? You think she's going to sit there and make a call to me and say, man, why did you run this? Or you should have run that. Or what were you doing here? And so we laugh about that. All the coaches that have coached my kids will tell you she's just a, an ideal parent uh, because I know the perception out there, you know, because of what I do for a living. But I never want to miss anything they do. Uh, I know not all parents can say that. Their jobs can't don't allow them to do that. My job did. And, uh, and it, it was just... It's wonderful. Just like now, I wish I could see every one of Kramer's pro games, but obviously I cannot. But man, when I can can do it, do it and get there, I do. Of course, watching your kids play, there's nothing better. I can relate a lot to what you're saying. I missed a lot when I was playing. You know, I, I missed a lot in the fall. Um, you know, I wasn't around much. So spring was always a big deal to us, which is why we play a lot of baseball. You know, I was, that right. was the season where dad was around. He could take yep. us to practice, take us to the batting cages, coach the teams. So we always went overboard in the spring and summer. And now it just as a byproduct, we spend a lot of time. My daughter plays spring soccer. So the spring is always kind of the highlight, but I'll tell you, I've rearranged vacations, speaking engagements. Yes. I, I've turned down going to events, endorsement deals, you name it. If it gets in the way of a tournament, I'm not missing it. I am not missing my kids' tournaments. I will skip out on things that pay me money. I will skip out on things that I won't do it. And, um, but it's a, again, it's a privilege to be able to make those decisions with your job and whatnot. So I recognize that, but uh, there's nothing better than watching your kids play. Hey, and it's not just in sports. If you have one that's not into sports, man, I may not know what you're yeah. doing if you're in music because I can't carry a tune. I know, but I'll be right there at the recital. It doesn't of course, matter. Absolutely. Whatever your kids uh, do, you need to be a part of it. And you need to, all they want is to say, my mom and dad are here. That's yep. it. Yep, they, they don't care. care how much you know. They just want you to hug them, whether they played a, a musical instrument worth a flip that night or if they were the star that night. Just hug them. You're here. And be in the moment with your child. And I'll say that whether it's sports or whatever it is. Be in the moment. And I bet you, like me, when you couldn't be there when you were playing it's amazing what FaceTime does, oh, right? Oh, man. I've seen so many games on FaceTime. My <laughs> wife's holding her phone. I'm like, Stay, hold the phone still. She's like, stop yes. yelling at me. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, it's because so true. Here's what would drive me nuts. If I couldn't be there, I'd say, what inning is it? How many outs? And this person wouldn't know. And I said, look, I'll just talk to Kramer afterwards. You know, they're just it's there. So true. It's so true. It's so true. Something else that comes up a lot. We talk to a lot of, you know, some of our guests. I, I was coached in high school. Our viewers know this. I was coached in high school by my father. He was a 40 year public high school football coach. My mom coached softball in high school. She was a PE teacher before she had us and, and didn't coach anymore. So again, I grew up with two brothers, all boys, all sports, very, very similar to what you're saying. And um, so I, the idea that coaching your kids and coaching other people's kids are very different. 
and he was very hard on us. He, he always told us, he said, listen, if you want to play on my teams, I'm going to coach you harder than I coach the other kids. Cause then none of these families will ever come down here and accuse me of favoritism or my kids, the quarterback, because he's my kid. Did you ever coach either of your two kids? Did, did you ever like, I know your time and, and whatnot was hard, but like, even when they were young, did you ever coach their teams officially? I never coached their teams. I had, my husband was a, he's a former college quarterback. He played at Louisiana yep. tech. They won a national championship. He did all the coaching of their teams. So okay. I never had to do that. Now you, you said a mouthful with your dad. When McKenzie came to Baylor to play for me, I didn't have to sit her down and, and tell her this is the way it's going to be. She just knew. She knew the criticism that was going to come from, you know, being my child. She knew how hard I would be on her. Uh, and honestly, I probably delayed playing her at Baylor and should have played her earlier than I did. But I rather I would rather err on the side of people saying you were too hard on your kid. You should have played her her junior year more than saying, oh, man, she showed favoritism. She should have never been on the floor. We're good with that. My children are good with that. Um, but, yeah, your dad's right on it, it. It's you don't treat your children and others because of the fact that if your dad is going to do justice by you guys, it's going to be, we're going to be harder on you. We're not going to do just the opposite and show favoritism. When you look back on, on the run you had, you know, from, from 2010 to 14, you win a national championship in, in 2012, your daughter's on the team. Like do, do those four years, I mean, you've accomplished a lot. You've coached some incredible players, some incredible teams. Was there something special having though your daughter and as challenging as it was, and I'm sure it added an interesting di dynamic, but it, when you look back on it, was there just something special knowing that one of the girls in that locker room was your own daughter? I think living in the moment, Greg, I don't think like that. I think as we get older and she, you know, yeah. uh, graduates and, and I head to a different phase in my coaching life, I look back on it and go, that was a blessing. Yeah. And not many college coaches get to coach their kid who is good enough to be on that court and not just a, a, a jersey number sitting on the bench to yeah. say, you know, that's my, gra my, my grandchild or that's my, my daughter. She was a contributor to the 2012 undefeated team. And then yep. the next year she's a senior and we make it to an elite eight. Um, and the thing that made it so special with her, you, you worry about not how she will handle herself in the locker room, She's going to hear it all. She's going to let them vent about her mom. She, she grew up listening to all that in the stands. But it's how those teammates respect her and they can become comfortable saying whatever they want in front of her about her mom. And I had one of uh, my former players just say, Coach, we would have never known McKenzie was your child by the way she conducted herself in the locker room. We never, ever hesitated to vent. We never hesitated to throw a towel or get mad at you and said it just didn't phase her. And she said, wow, how many young people could do that? That's really interesting. That's a super, that's really a really interesting point that I don't think people even think of. You know, they think about the dynamic between the coach sure. and their child, but there's some things said in the locker room. We've all been guilty of that, but Absolutely. There's, there's one girl down the, you know, locker down the, down the row where, you know, it's, it's personal and no, no matter what, it's still your mom, right? And no matter right. what, it's still your parent. Yeah, so that's a really, that's a really interesting insight. Um, I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, before we go, we have this last little segment, just real quick. We asked the same three questions to all of our guests. And again, coach, uh, I can't thank you enough. Just what you've accomplished, your perspective, not only as a parent, as a coach, as a player, it just fits so perfectly with what our message and what our mission here is on you think. So I can't thank you enough. Um, the first thing I have for you, what's something I feel like I might know the answer. What's something that's in youth sports today that you wish you knew when you were a kid? Hmm. I think there's more opportunities. Yeah. For um, for different levels of talent. Yep. Uh, back when we were growing up, you had one team, one organization, one whatever. And I just think, do your homework as a parent. Find that place where 
your kid can learn and grow and and uh, just have a, a good experience. I'm not going to say it's going to always be happy and it's not always going to not be tough, but there's a lot a lot out there to do. There's just more opportunities to do. Awesome. What well, you deal with a lot of parents. We've 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 talked about it just now. What would be one piece of advice that you would share with parents that are listening to this, that are navigating the youth sports experience right now with their son or daughter? Let your child handle everything in a way that you don't become that helicopter parent. You don't become that one that that gets the bad reputation that uh, I don't want him on my team. I don't care how good he is. They, they're they ridiculous sitting in the stands. Uh, they're going to gripe about everything. Be that parent that is supportive. Be that parent that, that cheers and is enthusiastic. And if you got to vent, vent away from people in a car driving home or vent at home, you know, in your bed at night. But don't be the parent that cost your child an opportunity because of how you act. That's great advice. I probably could use some of that myself. I'll be, that, I'm, very, not, I'm very open and honest on this show where I, I fall I, short. We've all had those moments. And, <laughs> We've and, all had and those think, moments. But, but you doing what you've done in your life, you have a, 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 a watch. People are watching how you respond. Yep. And Absolutely. so you have to be cognizant of that. Absolutely. So, it's, super, uh, it's so true. And you have to, you have to just, just know somebody's watching. And if they're not watching you, they're filming you with um, a camera. That's so true. <laughs> that's so true. Uh, the last one, what is the greatest challenge facing youth sports moving forward? I'm sure finances, um, are, are in some cities, particularly inner cities, the opportunities that kids don't have. I think, um, you, you want to, you want to give every body an opportunity to grow up uh, in athletics. And that's probably a big thing. And in, in, in we probably don't realize that because we grew up different parts of the country and had those opportunities. But I do have a sense of um, wanting everybody to to have the same opportunities. And so probably finances, I would I would think are a big part of it. Well, coach, I, again, I can't thank you so much uh, to, to have someone of your, of your, you know, stature of your, of your accomplishments to, to join us and just share your perspective and your experiences and how you view not only sports, but how you view parenting and, and family and culture um, is it, just such a huge treat for us here on you think I can't thank you enough. I wish your team this year, nothing but success, both of your children, your family, um, your grandchildren, I know we spoke offline about some of the similar health um, challenges that both of our families kind of share. So I wish you nothing but success. Overall, you were amazing and um, just greatly appreciate you taking some time today to uh, join us here on You Think. Well, Greg, thank you. And I'm, I'm just honored. And I'll always love talking about young people. Children touch my heart. Uh, and as you go on and you'll coach those boys as they get older, Always have that tight end pass across the Absolutely. middle in the scheme. Okay, we don't throw to the tight ends enough, big guy. That we 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 call that day one install. There Anything you go. we say that's day one install. That we we don't move to day two until certain things are accomplished. That's day one install, coach. That's a given. There you go, big <laughs> guy. Have a good one. All right, coach. Take care. Thank you so much. I hope you guys just really enjoyed that conversation with coach Kim Mulkey, um, as much as I did, uh, when I, when I heard that she was interested in joining us on you think I was just blown away. Of course, we've all, we all know about her historic, uh, coaching career. Of course we know her at Baylor and, you know, kind of the shocking decision for her to, to leave Baylor, that program she built in essence from scratch to go back home to her home state of Louisiana and take over the LSU, uh, women's basketball job. It kind of caught the the nation by storm and, and by surprise. But when you hear her talk, when you hear her passion, it, it, it makes sense to why she did it, you know, and, and just to hear her talking about coaching her daughter and, and her and her son, who went on to be a major league baseball player and the principles and the, and the practice that they had, you know, not only as a coach, but as a parent, I, I think there was a lot to relate to, you know, both the, the struggles and, you know, the good and the bad. So to, to have Coach Mulkey come on, you think, and share that perspective with us, 
um, was an absolute treat. So I, ho- I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as as we did um, having her on. And um, at this point, as you guys know, at this point of the show, we will bring on Tasha, my producer. Tasha, what's up? And uh, she has some uh, audience questions that we continue to get from all of our listeners and and followers on social. So thank you guys, as always, for sending them. And uh, Tasha, what do you have for today? Yeah, this one actually relates to you, Greg, um, because you are actually at a baseball tournament currently. Someone wanted to ask, the amount of yelling instead of coaching that goes on at youth sports is completely outrageous sometimes, which you've probably experienced at this tournament. So what is your advice for coaches on how to make sure there's more coaching going on than actual yelling? Yeah, and I think I think that's a, an interesting, you know, designation. I think there is a lot of yelling, and sometimes coaching is yelling, right? You're at these fields, you know. So take our mm-hmm. tournament now, right? We're at a baseball field. There's five fields going on, so there's multiple teams. Then there's teams that aren't playing that are waiting, so they're standing around. Every team nowadays has huge boom boxes, so there's walk up music. There's between innings music. The kids are cheering from the dugout, so. A lot of the instruction is yelling, but there is a big difference between yelling instruction, productive feedback, thoughts, reminders, corrections, and just yelling for the sake of yelling, right? And that's when you see a coach who's really coaching and you see a coach who doesn't really know what information his players need. So they just resort to screaming like, you've got to catch it. Yeah, no shit. But like, why did they (laughs) drop it? Why didn't they get the ball? Why didn't, you know, whatever the, whatever happened, like give us a why, give us something that the kid can absorb and apply so that the next time he has a better chance of being successful. To me, that's coaching. So yeah, I mean, we're at these tournaments and there is a lot of yelling and don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm doing my fair share, but I'm yelling instruction. I'm yelling information, reminders, how many outs what the situation is, where we're going with the ball, what the cuts are. I'm not just yelling, you've got to make a play. You've got to catch it. You have like, cause the kids don't know what that means. Like, yeah, no, I know coach, I got to catch it. But like, give me a piece of information that I can hang on to that gives me an opportunity to be successful. So yeah, I get it. And uh, listen, the emotions run high. We had a walk off the end of our game today. We had a walk off. They tried to turn a double play. One of our kids took out there sliding in the second. So it was an errant throw to first. Our kid ended up scoring the winning run. And they they challenged that our kid hit. And there's yelling and there's protest. And there's, I mean, there's a lot going on. We played eight innings in the 95 degrees. Everyone was tired. Everyone was worn out. So That's I crazy. get emotions run high. But there's a clear difference between yelling, instruction, and just yelling for the sake of yelling. That's good. Unrelated, you said kids have their walk-up song. What's your son's walk-up song? All right. So you want to hear it? Great. So he had a different walk-up song. And then I guess a bunch of the moms got together and they were going to like surprise the kids for one of the tournaments where they didn't know what the song was until their first at bat. So his, so my wife That's changed funny. it to Katy Perry, California girls, you know, like, California. <laughs> so he's walking up to bat um, either last tournament or the tournament before. And all of a sudden that goes blaring That's over awesome. the boot box and he kind of turns and looks through like the backstop to where the mom, where all the parents are sitting in the bleachers. And he just kind of laughs and giggles and he gets up there and he's just, he's liked it ever since. So that's uh, when he gets up to bat, he's like the, probably the that only kid in the park. That is an listening, amazing story. Yeah, listening to California Girl by Katy Perry. That's awesome. Uh, the next fan question is, it can cost more to watch an AAU game than some professional teams and leagues. I'm sure you guys had to travel for this tournament. They want to know, does that send the wrong message to kids? You know, I think cost is connected to access, is connected to opportunity. I think to to pretend that those aren't all intertwined is naive. Yeah, I mean, we're we're down here. We checked into this hotel in Atlanta on Thursday. And it's now Monday night and we're going to be here all day tomorrow. And the tournament ends at some point tomorrow based on when you lose. So, I mean, we've been here now for five nights and it adds up and we're going out to dinner and you're taking your kids, you know, you're driving. We drove four hours here and gas, it costs $150 to fill up your gas tank. So, I mean, it, it is not a cheap adventure, you know, to take your kids on travel sports, whether it's baseball or soccer or volleyball. I mean, every sport has their, their circuit. And it is. And, you know, it's one of those things that a lot of families make a lot of sacrifices 
a lot of families put off summer vacation. A lot of families put off travel and, and they build it into experiences with their kids around their sports. And some people think it's crazy and maybe those people are right. And other people wouldn't have it any other way. And maybe they're right. So there's something for everyone, but yeah, I mean, there is a sacrifice. There is a level of commitment to playing in these, you know, quote unquote, travel type youth sports scenarios. And, um, listen, it's not for everyone and that's okay. Not everyone maybe can wrap their minds around it and, and, and accept it and embrace it. And that's okay. But to the families that do it, you know, when you see your kid love something and you see a group of kids fight and scratch and claw and learn something about themselves after a long, hot day and they walk off the field and they, they saw themselves battle through a tough time and they came out the other side, those are life lessons that you can't put a price on, at least in my, in my opinion. Hmm. That's good stuff. And then the last question, a little veering off is what advice would you give an athlete that's currently vetting NIL deals right now? You know, it's funny. This is a timely question because someone actually asked me that the other day. They're like, how would you handle it? You know, for all these parents out there mm. that have high school age kids, like the college stuff I get, you know, those are in essence, those kids are adults by all, you know, in all reason, they're 18 plus years old. They're, right. they're adults relatively. But I mean, you're talking high school kids now, they're 16 years old. I mean, those, those are kids. Those are people that are not even close to like spreading their wings and getting out in the real world or living home with mom and dad. And they're fielding multiple six figure NIL, NIL deals. I mean, there's the story of the kid from California who's going to Tennessee to play quarterback. And the rumors are he got $8 million. He's a high school. He hasn't even played his high school senior year yet. You know, he's, he hasn't even gone to his high school prom. You know, so I, 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 you know, I sit there and I say, what would I do? Right. If it was me, what would I do? But then I also say like, my kid, is fortunate that they don't, my family doesn't need them to go out and chase those deals. But to a lot of these families, it's life changing. You know, you give a family a hundred thousand mm. dollar deal, that's life changing to a lot of these families. So I get it, right? I, I understand why they do it. I understand why they take it. It changes the future of their families forever. That used to be when you got drafted. That used to be when you went to the, to the pros but now these kids are changing their family's life when they're 16, 17 years old. And I think it's scary. I think it's dangerous. But at the same time, I don't fault any of these people. I understand why they're doing what they're doing. It's a ton of money to turn down. Is there a level of exploitation? Is there a level of what? Yeah, there's all of that. There's all of it wrapped in one box. And I just think that it's now out of the box and there's no putting it back in. And I think in a couple of years, my prediction is we're going to have a mess on our hands. Yeah. It already kind of feels like a mess to me. Yeah. And then, you know, there, there was the famous story, kind of right, of the Pittsburgh wide receiver. And again, I don't fault this kid. By no means am I crashing down on him. He had to do what he had to do. And, and I don't fault people for making decisions for their best interest. But let's take his situation. He wins the Bolitnikoff. Coming out of high school, he goes to Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh gives him an offer. He turns down whatever other schools to go to Pittsburgh, not a huge, you know, a good recruit, whatever. He has great success. They develop him and he wins the Belitnikoff, which is the top college wide receiver in the nation. He wins it this past year at Pitt. But now because of NIL and because it's connected to the transfer portal, he now is in essence a free agent and he can dictate his market. Right. In the NFL, you have to hope you make free agency at the height after your best season. But if you're under contract for three more years mm. with NIL and transfer portal, you can wait till you are at your height. Enter the portal, field all these offers of NIL money and then pick and choose in free agency where you go. But the team that developed you and brought you in and got you and helped you along to become the Bolitnikoff, they now lose you. Ugh. And they have, there is Tricky. nothing they can do for you. So I, now listen, do I fault uh, the kid for going to USC and making who knows how much? I, I don't ever fault anyone for making decisions that are in their own best interest. I don't. But I do say like, what are we doing here? I mean, this, I don't know. I, it's yeah. a, I just think there's an argument for all sides and I, and I just find it to be very messy and very, I don't know. I, I just, I, I hope in five years, we don't look back and say, oh my God, look what we created. Right. 
Right. But, the kids just got to do what they got to do, I guess. Uh, yeah. And listen, I don't fault that kid. He's changed his life forever. Whether he plays it down in the NFL, that money he's getting in NIL is life-changing money. And, what yeah. you're spo- and now you're supposed to accept yeah. that, that kid's supposed to turn it down? No. He's playing by the rules that have been laid out in front of him, and he's taking advantage of the, of the landscape. I don't fault anybody for playing by the rules. He didn't make the rules. He's just taking advantage of them, and I don't blame him. Yep. Well, that's all for the fan questions this week. And you can submit them via Instagram, TikTok, or Twitter at Greg Olson or at you think. Yep. And well, thank you, Tasha. Always, always look forward to our, uh, yeah. our end of the episode conversations and questions. So I appreciate you joining us. And as always, thank you guys so much for listening here um, on you think. I, I can't tell you, I've walked, so I've been around these ball fields now for four days. The amount of people from around the country that have stopped me and said, Hey, I listen to your podcast. I love your podcast. I coach, you know, I'm here coaching my kid's team. I'm really just blown away by the people that have come, that have sought me out and told me that they've listened here on you think to a lot of our episodes. And, you know, they may not always agree with my takes. They may not always agree with our our points, but I think what we're doing here is resonating with so many people. So thank you guys for, for continuing to follow along, for continuing to support us. Uh, Please continue to rate, review, subscribe wherever you guys get your pots and uh, we'll see you next week.